I'll start. So I'll start uh, uh, since you guys have muted yourself. Uh, so I'll be speaking today on the topic of low flow anesthesia. And uh, when Paul uh, put on a post on Facebook that he's been doing low flow anesthesia, practicing and preaching it for the last 10 years, I was a bit apprehensive that now, look, I've got to speak in front of one of those experts. Uh, but, but here, okay, it's my two cents. I've been doing a bit of low flow anesthesia also, I find it quite interesting and a bit challenging also. Uh, whenever I see this topic, it takes me back in time when I was doing my residency somewhere in, I had started my residency in 1998. And in those times, high flows were the norm. We would be working on the Boyle's basic machine and flows of four liters, six liters, eight liters and like. And uh, as I look back and I realize how times have changed, from the four liters, six liters, eight liters, now we are down, down to 500 ml or 1,000 ml and maybe even up to 250 ml. A lot of people think that uh, low flow anesthesia is a new concept, something which has come up new. Uh, but if we go back into time, one of our founding fathers, John Snow, he put out this concept. And if you read, he said that it follows as a necessary consequence of this mode of excretion of vapor that if its exhalation by the breath could, could in any way be stopped, its narcotic effects ought to be much prolonged. And this basically is the basic concept of low flow anesthesia. The vapor which is being exc excreted out, we're going to try to use it again and try to make it more economical, try to conserve the vapor which is being excreted. And John Snow first mentioned it way back in 1850 in the Lon London Medical Gazette. A uh, little more about the history, and we'll see that in 1924, Ralph Waters, he came out with the to and fro water system, in which he used uh, the to and fro system for the absorption of carbon dioxide. And similarly, Carl Goss and Herman Weiland, these two gentlemen also gave us the circle system in which they used pure acetylene as the anesthetic agent. While in 1930, Brian Sword, he developed the circle system for closed anesthesia. Around 1933, it was being seen that cyclopropane, which was both expensive as well as explosive. Uh, I couldn't see exactly what you were trying to show, Paul, but okay, anyways. Uh, the quantitative practice of anesthesia. Okay, 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 fine. Okay, uh, so I'll continue. In 1933, cyclopropane, which was both expensive as well as explosive, was being used. And to prevent uh, theater pollution and the resultant uh, risk of fire, the fire hazard, people were starting to use local anesthesia. But as time went by, trichloroethylene came into, came into the scene. And this was found to be incompatible with soda lime. Uh, it appears, Paul, you are not able to hear me. Now, now it's okay? Okay, fine. Fine. So, uh, as trichloroethylene came into the scene, it was found that it was incompatible with soda lime used to develop phosgene, which was a toxic gas. So, low flow anesthesia started to go out into vogue. And with the advent of halothin in 1954, halothin being highly potent with a narrow therapeutic index, and the vapors at that time were not very. Uh, functioning very good with low flows. So at around those times, because of halothane, because of trichloroethylene, the high flows came back into use. So this is basically what happened over a period of time. Initially, way back, people were using low flows, then the high flows came back, and now again, we are, life is taking a full circle, and we are going back to the low flows again. So before we start working on low flows, what exactly do we mean by low flows? And the most important thing which I've seen in most of the papers is that there's no clear cut definition of low flow. It is basically the concept is that the fresh gas flow should be less than the alveolar ventilation, a rebreathing fraction of great, greater than 50%. And this was shown by Folds. And he used one liter of fresh gas flow and he uh, gave it the terminology of low flow anesthesia. While virtue, with using a fresh gas flow of 250 mils and gave it at the term of 
minimal flow anesthesia. So these basically are broadly the concepts of low flow anesthesia. We are mainly trying to have a higher rebreathing fraction and a lower alveolar ventilation. Baker, in his paper in anesthesia intensive care, tried to classify low flow, the various flows, starting with the very high flows at four liters, going to high flow to two to four liters, a mid flow of around one to two liters, in which we are able to get a rebreathing of around 50% of, of the fresh gas flow. And then after that, then we are starting to go down really low into the basic low flow anesthesia, in which low flow was quantified as being around 500 ml to 1000 mils, enabling us to have a rebreathing fraction of around 80%. Coming down to minimal flow, where you are using gas flows of around 200 to 500 mils. And then finally, the lowest, which is metabolic flow, in which we are using 250 ml of fresh gas flow, pure oxygen, that is. And I would like us to re remember this number of 250 ml because this is the basic minimum amount of oxygen which a human body is going to need. So moving forward, after we have broadly classified what exactly is low flow anesthesia, we'll, first before we try to, un to um, work out on how we are going to do low flow anesthesia, let us try to understand some of the basic theoretical concepts of low flow anesthesia. See, when we are using fresh gas flow, which is higher than the minute ventilation, then things are very easy. A constant amount of gas is being delivered. A constant concentration of volatile anesthetic is being developed. Most of the expired gas is getting vented out. The composition does not vary on the time, depending on the time of anesthetics. So this is basically a very easy method. You have dialed up high flow volumes of 4 liters, 5 liters, 6 liters. The anesthesia might continue for 1 hour, 2 hour, 3 hour, 4 hours, whatever. It doesn't really make a big, big difference. But as we start to decrease the fresh gas flow, as we start to dial down, our rebreathing fraction starts to increase. And this is what basically develops the fear in the people who are not using low flow anesthesia or people who are being newly introduced into the world of new low flow anesthesia that as we are dialing down, the rebreathing fraction is increasing. So maybe we might develop a hypoxic, uh, deliver a hypoxic mixture, or we might unintentionally cause hypercarbia, or we might unintentionally give very high doses of volatile anesthetics or underdose the volatile anesthetics. So this is basically the fear which starts to develop in those people who are either new into low flow anesthesia doing it for the first time and by this lecture basically what i'm trying to do is i'm going to try to remove this fear while giving this lecture see i'm acutely aware of the fact that an all we're going to have a a pan what should i say a pan world audience people who are working in the in countries like maybe uk us working in tertiary level hospitals like Paul is in Israel, to me who's in India, to people who are working in the smaller cities of India or other, other countries. We are going to have an aesthetist working right across the spectrum who will be working on high-end workstations to people who, might, who are still working with the Boyle's basic machine. So being highly aware of this fact, I'm going to basically try to simplify it down and bring it down to a basic minimum so that people who are using it daily are able to understand what i'm saying people who are using it daily without too much theoretical knowledge will come out of this lecture with a stronger theoretical knowledge and people who are not using it will get a better clarity will have a better understanding of low flow anesthesia and so maybe maybe they'll make some baby steps into the world of low flow anesthesia so the first and first most important thing, the basic thing which we are going to need for low flow anesthesia is a closed circuit or a circle system. As we all know, it's going to have an expiratory and inspiratory limb, one patient end, the unidirectional valves, and then the machine end, which will consider, which will consist of the fresh gas flow inlet, the can with the CO2 absorber, which is soda lime, the reservoir bag, and the pop off APL valve. Uh, the basic configuration of the FGF, the can, the reservoir bag, and the APL does not really is a 
I mean, it's not very hard and fast where you're going to keep it as long as it is between the two unidirectional valves. So our main aim is to have the patient end on one side, the machine end on the other side, and the two unidirectional valves. So this is basically the basic circuit which we are going to use when we are going to use the low flow system, low flow anesthesia. The other important component is soda line. Most of you are aware, but just to revise it, it is going to contain sod sodium hydroxide, potassium hydroxide, some 14 to 19% of water, and the rest which would be calcium hydroxide and our basic equation, which is the, um, the, the um, CO2 reacting with water to form carbonic acid, then the sodium hydroxide reacting with the carbonic acid to form sodium carbonate, and then the sodium carbonate again getting regenerated back to sodium hydroxide after it has reacted with the calcium hydroxide. This is the basic, the, the basic equation which happens when we are using soda lime. Uh, there are various other types of soda limes like bear lime, like Amsorb and all those things, but I'm keeping it to the basic, the basic soda lime, which is most commonly used. Now, when we are doing low flow anesthesia, what exactly is our aim? What are we trying to achieve and how are we going to do things to achieve our aim? The first thing which are we are trying to do is we are trying to replenish the consumed gases. See, consider low flow anesthesia as a closed loop, as a closed circuit with the patient on one end and your machine on the other end. The patient is taking in some little things, which is the oxygen, the nitrous oxide, the volatile anesthetic, and the other end, we are the anesthetists are sitting on the other end and playing with our controls to try to replace what the patient is taking in. So the low of the, the aim of low flow anesthesia is we, we are going to try to replenish the consumed gases. And when we try to replenish the consumed gases, we try to do it exactly in a similar composition and amount to what has been taken up with the patient. This is the basic trick of the whole game. We are going to try to replace it one with the, try to replace it as exactly as possible with a similar composition. And two, try to replace it with the similar amount as has been taken up by the patient. And while trying to replace it, try to use the minimum amount of fresh gas flow possible. And obviously all this has to be done after the CO2 has been absorbed because CO2 absorption is also one of the basic constituents of low flow anesthesia. So consider low flow anesthesia as a closed loop with the patient on one end and you as the anesthetist on the other end and we are trying to maintain that basic equilibrium of things going in and coming out and going in and coming out again and again through the whole time of anesthesia. So this is our basic aim of low an flow anesthesia. Some of the boring aspects of anesthesia, low flow anesthesia, the basic theoretical aspects. Obviously, we are not, not mathematicians that we are going to be doing mathematical equations while we are doing low flow anesthesia, but we should have a knowledge of these formulas because they will help us to understand what exactly happens in the fresh gas flow while low flow anesthesia is being administered. So the first important thing is that whenever we are giving anesthesia to anybody, the most important thing is that the patient is going to be consuming oxygen. And how do we calculate how much this oxygen is being con consumed? That is by the Brodie's formula, which in the most simplest form is 3.4 into body weight, ml per minute. The original formula is 10 into body weight to the power of 3 by 4. And if you simplify it down, it comes to 3.4 into body weight, which is approximately 250 ml in around a guy who's around 80 to 100 kgs. So, and this consumption remains constant right throughout the anesthesia procedure. So whether it is at minute five of anesthesia or whether it is minute 200 of the anesthesia, this consumption would remain approximately constant in a patient who's under anesthesia under basic normal stable conditions. I'm not talking about hypermetabolic conditions or a, or a situation where the patient is crashing or is low, extremely low hemodynamic status. I'm talking about a basic normal stable condition. In those conditions, what we are going to expect is 
that our patient is going to consume around 250 ml of oxygen per minute. The other constituent of our fresh gas flow is nitrous oxide. Again, a, a mathematical equation, which is known as the serving gas formula. And the consumption of nitrous oxide is basic th thousand into time to the power of half. Again, as anesthetists, we are not expected to do mathematical calculations while we are giving anesthesia. But the most important thing for us to consider in this is that the uptake is inverse to time, which is that as the time increases, the uptake of nitrous oxide starts to fall. While the uptake of, of oxygen, on the other hand, remains the same, if you remember the previous slide, around 250 ml per minute, in nitrous oxide, it is an inverse to the time constant. So the uptake of nitrous oxide as the time duration of anesthesia increases, the amount of nitrous oxide which is being taken up starts to fall. And this uptake is basically dependent on the alveolar arteria pressure difference. And like I said, it is high initially, decreases with time. And the nitrous oxide is mostly not metabolized so as the uptake decreases, most more and more of the nitrous oxide starts to get excreted out in the expiratory gases. And the third thing which we have in our fresh gas flow is the volatile anesthetics. So we have oxygen, which is being used constantly at 250 ml per minute, right throughout the anesthesia duration. Then we have nitrous oxide, which in the initial stage of anesthesia would be used at a higher amount and then the amount would start to fall down as the time of anesthesia keeps on going on increasing. And the third constituent of our fresh gas flow would be the volatile anesthetics. And again, for this, a formula has been devised, which is known as the Lewis formula. And as you can see in this formula, the amount of volatile anesthetic which is being used depends on the factor of MAC. So if it is 0.8 mac, the F would mean 0.8. So it depends on factor of mac, then the blood gas co coefficient, then it depends on the cardiac output, and then it depends on T to the power of power of minus half. Again, it is inversely proportional to the time. So again, we have to understand is that as the time of anesthesia increases, the consumption of our volatile anesthetic start to decrease they exponentially decrease with the increase in time. Other factors remaining constant, that is the cardiac output remaining constant, the MAC remaining constant. As our time of anesthesia would increase, our requirement of volatile anesthetics would start to decrease. So the three main constituents of our fresh gas flow, which is oxygen, which is nitrous oxide, and which is volatile anesthetics have different, different functions as per the time. The oxygen consumption remains constant. The nitrous oxide consumption starts to fall down as the time of anesthesia increases. And similarly, the consumption of the volatile anesthetics also start to fall down as the time of anesthesia keeps on going forward. When we are delivering, delivering our volatile anesthetics, this is what we are trying to achieve. We are basically trying to achieve a MAC of 1.3. And the MAC of 1.3, as we all know, is that it, the, uh, achieving a MAC of 1.3 does not cause movement in a patient when the patient is subject to a surgical stimulus. So our aim of giving, when we are giving fresh gas flow or when we are giving high gas, gas flow, our aim is that our patient should have achieved a MAC of 1.3. To achieve the MAC of 1.3, we can use opioids, we can use uh, nitrous oxide, we can use volatile anesthetic, but in the end, what we are trying to do is we are trying to achieve a MAC of 1.3 so that 95% of our patient would tolerate the skin incision and would not move when a skin incision is being made. So the factors, see, we are using volatile anesthetics and our aim is to, to achieve an alveolar concentration of and to try and achieve a MAC of 1.3. So there are multiple factors which, which influence the buildup of the volatile anesthetics into the, into the alveoli. And this 
slide will show what exactly are the factors that affect the the the, the concentration of the volatile anesthetic in our alveoli the obviously is how much of the volatile anesthetic is being delivered which will de depend on how much of the volatile anesthetic we have dialed up in our vaporizer and the circuit volume which we are using so if we have dialed up let us say 4% obviously a higher percentage of the volatile anesthetic is being de delivered then once the volatile anesthetic has been delivered into the lung how fast it is going to reach into the alveoli which will develop which will depend on our ventilation and on the concentration effect and the last once the volatile anesthetic has reached into the alveoli the other factors which come into play is the blood gas coefficient our cardiac output and the alveolar venous gradient which determine how quickly the volatile anesthetic is taken up from the alveoli into our blood stream a high blood gas coefficient means that uh, the volatile anesthetic is taken up quickly from the alveoli and goes into the blood a high cardiac output means that a large amount of blood is being developed is being delivered to the alveoli which will facilitate quicker removal of the volatile anesthetic from our alveoli and similarly the higher the alveolar venous gradient quicker the volatile anesthetic will be taken up from the alveoli so this basically are the factors which will develop which will determine the concentration of the volatile anesthetic which we are going to achieve in our alveoli which will be the dialed concentration in our vaporizer our rate of ventilation then on the blood gas coefficient the cardiac output and all these factors this graph there are three graphs which i'm basically going to show these one two and these are three and these three graphs basically depict pictorially what exactly is happening this is the first graph which is depicting pictorially the, the 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 three formulas which we had talked about the brody's formula the serving gauss formula and the lois formula and in this you can see down at the bottom in the white which is the oxygen the oxygen con consumption it is basically showing the consumption of the three gases oxygen isofluorine and nitrous oxide in a graphical manner and this is basically the pictorial re representation of our three formulas the brody formula the serving gauss formula and the lois formula and if you can see in the white color we have oxygen and the consumption of oxygen as the time increases from 5 minutes right down to 120 minutes the consumption of oxygen remains the same right throughout and this is a very important point for us and we have to remember that right throughout as uh, this and the anesthesia experience of the patient when we are using fresh gas flow the this basic amount of oxygen has to be de delivered at all time we can't go down below that the other thing is which you can see is for isofluorine in this purple magenta color you can see initially slightly higher concentration is taken up and then as time passes it stabilizes out and remains fairly constant right throughout the anesthesia experience from time 0 to time 120 and for blue you can see initially a high concentration of gas is being taken up falls down dramatically and then again kind of stabilizes out and the consumption became becomes kind of, kind of constant so this is a pictorial representation of our three mathematic mathematical formulas which we had talked about earlier similarly the the previous graph had shown the consumption of isofluorine this graph is showing the consumption of the all our volatile anesthetics right right from halothane down to desfluorine and the thing which is common in all of these volatile anesthetics is that the initial consumption is high and then as the time passes the consumption of volatile anesthetic falls down dramatically the clinical implication of this for us is that in our initial phase we have to give a higher volume a higher concentration of the volatile anesthetics and once the initial phase has passed off the requirement of volatile anesthetics is going to stabilize out this is our clinical impl implication for us and when we superimpose the the first graph on our gas flows this gives basically a pictorial representation of what exactly happens in real time 
when we are using low flow anesthesia or minimal flow anesthesia or the complete closed loop circuit in low flow anesthesia initially we are giving high flows and then decreasing the flows in minimal flow also initially starting with the high flows and decreasing it down to 500 ml and then with closed loop starting with the high flows and over a period of time decreasing the fresh gas flow to around 300 ml and this gas gas flows we have superimposed onto our requirements of nitrous oxide oxygen and volatile anesthetics and this kind of gives a pictorial representation of what exactly is happening with regards to our fresh gas flow and with regards to our volatile anesthetics as time passes in the anesthesia anesthesia experience the other thing what is happening is like i said this is a closed loop on one end the 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 patient is taking up some gases and the on the other end we are trying to match this uptake and in this whole closed loop the the the, the patient is also breathing out gases so what exactly the 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 effect of these expired gases has on the concentration of the gases which are present in our closed circuit the expired gases are also being pushed back into the closed circuit so first thing what happens is our expired gas con contains carbon dioxide the carbon dioxide get gets absorbed by the soda line then our expired gases con con contain oxygen they contain nitrous oxide and they contain the exhaled volatile anesthetics so the expired oxygen the expired nitrous oxide and the expired volatile anesthetic they will go and mix with the fresh gas flow now think about this for a moment in our fresh gas flow we have we are trying to deliver let us say 60% of fio2 and our expired gas obviously has lesser amount of fio2 so when the expired gas will go and mixed with our fresh gas flow just try to imagine our fresh gas flow is having 60% oxygen our expired gas is having lesser amount of oxygen 18 20% and that is being put back into the closed circuit it is going and mixing with the fresh gas flow so what will happen is that the 60% of the fio2 starts to get diluted down this is a very important concept which we have to remember while we are conducting low flow anesthesia the concept that the fresh gas flow which we are giving the fio2 which we are giving from the from our rotameters from our flow meters which might be around 50% 40% 60% that will get diluted by the expired oxygen and as a result of which the amount of oxygen which will be delivered to the patient will be lesser than what we are delivering through our rotor meters and this is the basic concept of the hypoxic mixture and this is something which we have to be careful about and this is something which we have to factor in when we are doing our low flow anesthesia similarly there can be some amount of dilute dilute dilution of our volatile anesthetic because some amount of volatile anesthetics will be taken up by the body and the resultant expired volatile anesthetics which will be of lesser concentration will dilute the volatile anesthetics which are present in the gas in the fresh gas flow so this basically is that the our expired gases are basically diluting the gases which we are delivering from our anesthesia machine and because of this mixing what we are dialing up at our rotor meters what we are dialing up at our vaporizers is not exactly the same to what is being delivered to the patient at the patient end and this is something we as anesthetists have to be aware of and this is what basically we are trying to do right throughout our low flow anesthesia another concept which we should be clear about i mean see just now it might seem a bit disconnected what we are what i am trying to say over here but this is also an important concept and once we have gone th gone through the theoretical aspect all the theoretical aspects when taken in together will bring out a more clearer picture of what exactly is happening so this is one more concept the concept of time constant put it simply time constant means that when we are doing low flow anesthesia if just now i change the concentration of my sevo fluorine from 3% to 5% after how long will it affect the patient on the other end 
it is not instantaneous like in a fresh gas flow when of in a high volume fresh gas flow when we are using a high volume fresh gas flow of 5 liter or 6 liter i will dial up dial up from 3% to 5% and nearly instantaneously on the other patient end the co concentration will increase from 3% to 5% in low flow anesthesia it does not happen that way and this is basically what is time constant time constant is when i change the concentration on my end at the vaporizer and at the rotameter after how much time lag that changes will reflect on to the patient end so this is basically a measurement of the time it takes for alteration in the fresh gas co composition to lead to corresponding alterations of gas compositions within the breathing system and conway gave a formula in which he said the time constant is basically the volume of system which is divided by the volume of the gases which is being delivered minus the uptake mathematically to make it more easy it is like this the time constant is basically the volume of the system now what exactly is the volume of the system some people say the volume of the system is basically the volume of the closed circuit approximately 6 liters other people say it is basically the volume of the closed circuit plus frc working out to approximately 8 liters so for mathematical simplicity let us say it is 6 liters so the volume of the system is 6 liters divided by the fresh gas flow let us say for mathematical simplicity again that the fresh gas flow is 1 liter so what exactly is the time constant time constant is the volume of the system of 6 liters being divided by 1 liter so 6 divided by 1 it is 6 minute one time constant that is if i change my vaporizer setting just now in one time constant that is in 6 minute there will only be a 63% change in the concentration and it takes a total of three time constants not one not two but a total of three time constants which would be 18 minutes to cause a 95% change practically think about it this way if i want to let us say the patient is starting to have some amount of hypertensive response or the patient is showing some tachycardia or the bis uh, numbers are not up to my liking and to increase the depth of anesthesia i am changing the concentration of co fluorine from 2.5% to 3.5% it will take 18 minutes for those changes to occur and this is a time lag which obviously is too long and not 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 acceptable because 18 minutes is too long a time lag that that will that is happening that will allow for changes in my gas concentration when i am using a fresh gas flow of 1 minute how we are going to overcome this what are we going to do about this i'll deal with that in the next section basically for the more the important thing over here is for us to understand the concept of what exactly time constant mean so like as shown over here when we are using a fresh gas flow of 1 liter three time constants would mean 18 minutes for changes to occur so this basically was the 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 the, the theory of low flow anesthesia the uptakes the uptakes of oxygen the uptake of nitrous oxide the uptake of of our volatile anesthetics the second thing is the dilution of our <clears throat> fresh gas flow which occurs and the third thing is the time constant now putting this into practical use how are we going to do our low flow anesthesia so before we are going to do low flow anesthesia we obviously are going to need some equipment which will help us manage the low flow anesthesia in a way which is safe for the patient and all obviously also medical legally safe so monitoring equipment mandatory entitled co2 measurement you should not and um, may i say i um, may even say you cannot do low flow anesthesia without it to co2 monitoring the other thing is the gas analysis that is the best thing 
maybe some people may be doing low flow anesthesia without gas analysis but i would not certainly not recommend it so the next thing is we should have gas analysis that is we should be able to measure the inspired and the expired concentration of the gases which we are using which would be oxygen nitrous oxide and volatile anesthetics then our anesthesia machines should have the low flow ro rotameters that is we should be able to del to deliver accurately 250 ml 300 ml 500 ml of gases if we required uh, some of the older machines if you remember would obligatorily deliver 200 ml of oxygen even when the oxygen was shut off this was considered as a safety mechanism to prevention of hypoxia uh, this would obviously slightly hinder in our working of doing low flow anesthesia so our machine should not have that safety mechanism if i may say so it should not have that to a minimum requirement of 200 ml of oxygen then the other thing is which we are going to require is our vaporizers when we are doing low real low flow anesthesia going down to 250 ml 300 ml then our vaporizers should be such that they should de de deliver the exact and accurate volume of the volatile anesthetic even at those low flow levels because it is seen most of the times as the gas flow start to decrease the vaporizer output also starts to decrease especially at the low flow levels of 250 300 ml 500 ml so we should use those vaporizers the modern vaporizers which do not face this kind of problem once we are dealing with gas flows of 300 ml 400 ml 500 ml obviously our system should be leak proof if i am using 500 ml of gases and 300 ml is going to leak out then i am going to have a problem obviously my, i am going to fail in my low flow anesthesia so theoretically it is said that our leakage should be less than 100 ml at a, at a pressure of 20 millibar and the other thing which we have to consider is that this is something which people tend to miss out is that if the the gas analyzer if they are the side stream analyzer not the mainstream the side stream analyzer they tend to suck out 50 to 250 ml of gas 200 ml of the gases and if you are using let us say 500 ml of fresh gas flow and 50, around 200 ml gets sucked out then we are going to have gas deficiency so in that scenario what should be happening is that the gas analysis the gas which is getting sucked out should come back into the circuit so that a gas deficiency does not develop so these are the basic requirements which we need our monitoring equipment etco2 and gas analyzers our anesthesia machine which is capable of deliver, delivering low flow absence of absence of leakages potent vaporizers and our gas analyzers these are the things which we require as a bare minimum so with our knowledge in hand with our knowledge of oxygen consumption nitrous oxide consumption with our knowledge of volatile anesthetic con consumption with our knowledge of time constant with our knowledge of dilution of fresh gas flow with this knowledge in hand now let us come to the fact how are we going to conduct low flow anesthesia for each point of view i have basically described it low flow anesthesia using nitrous oxide because using nitrous oxide in my view makes it a little bit more complicated when we are using air it it is slightly less complicated so i am going to explain it low flow anesthesia when we are using nitrous oxide whether you want to use nitrous oxide or you do not want to use nitrous oxide that is another question in itself that is another discussion in itself there are some people who are pro nitrous oxide there are some people who are not pro nitrous oxide i am not going into that into that i am basically going to explain how you would do low flow anesthesia using nitrous oxide because nitrous oxide makes it slightly more difficult the conduct of low flow anesthesia so step 1 our pre medication pre oxygenation and induction they basically follow the similar technique you pre medicate as you would pre medicate any other person use your whatever you want to use and you induce using your basic propofol or whatever induction techniques intravenous induction techniques which you are using the pre oxygenation while pre oxygenation is pre oxygenation in itself for us when we are using you low flow anesthesia pre oxygenation also has an other um, function and the other function is denitrogenation 
what we are trying to do is we are trying to empty out our lungs of the nitrogen gas because the air we breathe contains oxygen as well as nitrogen and if we don't empty out this nitrogen gas the nitrogen gas will be expired out will go into the closed circuit and will again cause the problem of diluting our fresh gas flow because from our side from the anesthesia machine side we are not developing uh, not delivering any nitrogen gas but our body will be excreting out the nitrogen gas the nitrogen gas will go into the closed circuit and will dilute our fio2 will dilute our volatile anesthetic so our aim of pre oxygenation while it is also to oxygenate the other important aim for us under low flow anesthesia is to basically denitrogenate our lungs so when we are uh, after induction we are di we are doing a pre oxygenation we will denitrogenate our lungs and the other thing which we are trying to do is we are trying to achieve a mac like i said earlier we are trying to achieve a mac of alveolar mac of 1.3 how do we do this if i will go back again to the time constant we will first use a high flow gas we are talking about low flow anesthesia but in our initiation phase we are going to use high flow gas why are we going to use high flow gas the concept of time constant comes into play over here if we are going to use low flow gas any changes which we do at our anesthesia machine end would take 15 minutes 16 minutes 18 minutes to affect the patient when we use high flow gas let us say our system volume is 6 liters i am using let us say 6 liters of gas so my time constant becomes 1 minute and three time constants that is 3 minutes so in 3 minutes if i am giving 50 to 60% of fio2 within 3 minutes the patient will start to re to receive 60% of fio2 if i am giving a mac of let us say a mac of 1 i am dialed i have dialed up a mac of 1 on my vaporizer in 3 minutes the patient would have received a mac of 1 and the alveoli concentration would receive it would reach a mac of 1 of the volatile anesthetic so this basically is the initiation phase try to understand low flow anesthesia has an initiation phase of high flow gases may seem paradoxical but it is not the high flow gases we are trying to quickly achieve our targets of denitrogenation of lungs and we are quickly trying to achieve our targets of reaching the mac of 1.3 so practically what will be done is practically we will keep our flows to around 6 to 8 liters for a period of 10 to 15 minutes during this time we are trying to achieve a mac of 1.3 the other technique which has also been described in our book i have not really used this is that when we are doing our pre oxygenation we are doing our pre oxygenation by the old time bain circuit while our close circuit we will close the mouth of the close circuit with a reservoir bag and fill it up with oxygen nitrous oxide and our required concentration of volatile anesthetic i have not really done this but it has been theoretically described that while we are pre oxygenating using the bain circuit on the other hand i am filling up the close circuit i am closing the mouth of the close circuit with a reservoir bag and i am filling that up with my desired concentration so if i am wanting an fio2 of 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 uh, i am wanting a fio2 of 50% i will fill it up with 50% oxygen nitrous oxide and a co fluorine of 2% and i'll allow that circuit to fill up during the time while the patient is being pre oxygenated i will then induce the patient to do an intravenous induction intubate the trachea and larynx and immediately connect the closed circuit to the endotracheal tube so i have immediately with the pre filled gases the pre filled gases with that concentration will go into the lung and will immediately reach the required concentration of mac will reach the required and the desired concentration of fio2 levels so this is basically the concept of the pre filled circuit and the other thing again i have not seen this is that you inject small aliquots small amounts of liquid volatile anesthetics 
into the circuit. The theory behind is that we are requiring around 400 to 50, 500 ml of vapor in the first 10 minutes, and we will inject 0.2 to 0.5 ml of the volatile anesthetics into the circuit. The volatile anesthetics will immediately vaporize, fill up the circuit, will allow us to, re to, to um, achieve the required MAC concentrations. I would like, uh, so these are the basic three things. And in this, I would like to just talk about a little bit about what is known as overpressurization. The overpressurization is basically similar to what we are using with our gas flows. We are using high volume of gas flows with the aim of decreasing our time constants, with the aim of quickly achieving our required MAC, concent MAC concentration, with our aim of quickly achieving the desired inspired oxygen concentrations. Similarly, for the volatile anesthetic, what we'll do if, let us say, let us say, we want to achieve a, that CO fluorine should be 2% in my gas. Rather than keeping the dial of my CO fluorine at 2%, I will dial it up and increase it to 3 to 4%. So that a higher volume of CO fluorine gets delivered into the gases. And again, aim that I should be able to reach the MAC 1.3 quickly. By giving a higher concentration of CO fluorine, a higher 3 to 4 percent of CO fluorine, I will be, deliver, be delivering larger volumes of CO fluorine into my closed circuit. And when the larger volumes are delivered, the MAC concentrations are achieved quickly. And this concept is known as overpressurization. Pressure, it is similar to using larger volume of gases to decrease our time constants. Similarly, this is using larger concentration of volatile anesthetics to achieve a MAC of 1.3. So now we have basically done our initiation. We have used high, high volumes of gases, 8 to 2, 8 liters, 10 liters, 6 liters, 8, for a period of 10 to 15 minutes. We have now been able to achieve a MAC of 1.3. See, uh, the other thing which I want to say is, the theoret we are talking about the theoretical aspects of using of of uh, of uh, using a time of 10 to 15 minutes of using of gases of 6 liters and 8 liters in my view these things become a little redundant once we have our gas analyzers in place because once we have our gas analyzers in place we are able to see real time on what exactly is happening at the patient end and then the those absolute values become a little re redundant that that we should keep it for 10 minutes or we should keep it for 15 minutes or we should use 8 liters of oxygen or we should use 10 liters of fresh gas flow our aim is to achieve a mac of 1.3 if we have a gas analyzers in front of us and on our screen once we see that mac level is is reached we know that our initiation phase has been achieved so once our initiation phase has been achieved, we have reached our MAC levels. The patient has started to receive the required concentration of oxygen and nitrous oxide. We then move on to what is known as our maintenance phase. The maintenance phase is after that initial 10 to 15 minutes period. And if you remember the initial Brody's formula, the oxygen concentration generally remains constant of around 250 ml. while the nitrous oxide and the volatile consumptions have now fallen down drastically. If you remember the graph, the first graph, which I, uh, the second graph, which I had shown, that the volatile anesthetics are going down like this. In the first graph, the oxygen is remaining straight, the nitrous oxide is going down. So the oxygen concentration is generally constant, while the nitrous oxide and the volatile anesthetic concentrations have fallen down drastically. So what effect does that have on our, what is happening inside the circuit? What, how does it affect our gases? How does it affect the gases which are reaching the patient? The oxygen consumption is continuous. So let us say I'm delivering 500 ml of oxygen. 250 ml is going to be removed. And the expired, air will also have a lesser amount of oxygen. So basically what will happen is that in the maintenance phase, 
the oxygen because of the consumption that is because of the removal and because a, a lesser amount of oxygen is being expired out our fresh gas flow oxygen is going to get diluted so if we are having a fresh gas flow of 50% fio2.5 by the time it will reach the patient end it will get diluted there is no two ways about it please people who are going to do this for the first time or people who are doing this initially have to remember this this is a very crucial piece of information because of the continuous uptake of the oxygen and because of the dilution of the oxygen by the expired gas the amount of oxygen which is being present in the fresh gas flow is going to get diluted by the time it reaches the patient end so to protect this if we can see on our gas analyzers that our fi2 levels are falling down the two things which we can do is we should increase our oxygen levels by 10% while similarly decreasing the nitrous oxide by 10% or if you are using absolute minimal flows of 250 ml increase oxygen by 50 ml and decrease the nitrous oxide by 50 ml what i generally do is that when i am using reaching the maintenance phase i would like to keep my fi2s at around 0.6 to 0.7 so i have this peace of mind that okay this fluctuations which are going to be happened are going to be taken care of okay my eye will be there on the gas analyzer but with an fio2 of 0.6 to 0.7 i have that safety margin that things will not go wrong so we have to be very careful of this dilution effect which is going to be which is going to happen in this maintenance phase again the volatile anesthetic is also going to get diluted and two reasons for that one is like i said our vaporizers at very low flows which is around 250 ml 500 ml 700 ml will not deliver will overestimate delivery so if you are dialed up the vaporizer at 3% it will not deliver deliver 3% it might de deliver 2% so our the 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 amount of volatile anesthetic is going to be less and two again the volatile anesthetic is again going to be diluted by the expired gases the third thing which i have also which i one of the papers was talking about was that some amount of metabolism of the volatile anesthetic also happens and they gave these facts and figures that for halothane it is 30% metabolism so you should increase the 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 uh, the dials to by 30 to 50% for isoflurane it is 0.2% my uh, metabolism so you should increase it by 10% for cvo it is there will be 3% metabolism so you should increase it by 15% and for des the metabolism is going to be very minimal so maybe you can increase it maybe 1 or 2% so the take away thing over here is that during the maintenance phase if uh, we should also increase our concentration of volatile anesthetics despite the fact that the uptake of volatile anesthetics has stabilized out for two reasons one because of dilution and two because the vaporizer will overestimate will give an overestimate of the the concentration would be delivered and three there will be some amount of metabolism also by the volatile anesthetic so practically speaking if we would say that during the maintenance phase if we are using cvo fluoran with nitrous oxide and we are keeping our cvo fluoran at 0.8 mac try to keep it around 2 to 3% concentration taking into consideration the mac of nitrous oxide also to achieve a total mac of 1.3 so if we are delivering cvo at 0.8 mac try to keep it our vaporizer concentration at around 2 to 3 2 to 3% for test flure and try to keep it at around 4 4 to 6% so that we are not under under developing uh, delivering our volatile anesthetic our maintenance phase is through in our maintenance phase just to recapitulate we have to slightly increase the concentration of oxygen we have to slightly increase the concentration of volatile anesthetic because the reasons because of dilution and because of uptake and again see while low flow anesthesia might be technically and theoretically very complicated but if we have our gas analyzers 
it makes life very easy we can see in real time what is happening and then we can play with our dials and controls to control whatever is being delivered to the patient so after the maintenance phase we are now trying to recover the patient and there and three techniques have been mentioned for recovering of the patient the first technique being coasting coasting simply put is that if you are having a flow of let us say 1 liter if you are having a flow of say 1 liter it will take the reverse we will have three time constants in reverse so to bring it down to the volatile anesthetic concentration down to zero to bring it down to level it would take you nearly three time constant which would be around 18 minutes so what we do is we will keep the gas flow at low le- low flow levels 500 ml 1000 ml whatever we are using but we will switch off our vaporizer some around 15 minutes before and basically allow it to coast down slowly 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 the 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 mac levels will start to decrease and slowly they will decrease down to a level where the patient will start to wake up the other thing is you we don't change our vaporizer level to let us say 5 minutes before the end before the end of surgery and then we close off our vaporizer increase our fresh gas flows subsequently because of which our time constants will also will decrease and we allow for a, for a quick washout of the volatile anesthetic and this quick washout all will then allow our patients to wake up quickly and the third thing which i have which i saw in literature i have not seen this personally is that to use active charcoal filters which are heated at 220 degree centigrade and they are inserted into the circuit and they will quickly absorb uh, your vaporizer uh, your vapors of the volatile anesthetic and then they will allow the patient to wake up so basically there have been three techniques which have been mentioned for allowing the patient to recover so this is basically the conduct of low flow anesthesia now the moot question arises why go into low flow anesthesia and it has been proven without doubt that low flow anesthesia is much more economical i mean let us do the simple maths if we are going to use 6 liter of gases for a period of let us say 120 minutes so that is 720 liter of gases and on the other hand we are going to use let us say 500 ml of gases for over a, for for 2 hours the amount of gases which are being used are drastically reduced so obviously economy is a major driving factor for the use of low flow anesthesia the other thing with time environment has become very important for us and by using low flow anesthesia see isoflurane and um, halothane isoflurane are said to be halogenated uh, cfcs chlorofluorocarbons they are having chlorine and they are having fluorine and the, when they go up into the atmosphere and under the influence of uv light the chlorine breaks off and then it causes ozone depletion so halothane and isoflurane have been implicated in ozone depletion des and sivo because they are basically hal- halogenated fluoride ions only are not implicated in ozone depletion but they are also implicated in greenhouse effects so with more awareness about uh, uh, about the environment in our days we should try to u- minimize the utilization of our our volatile anesthetics which can be done by the use of low flow anesthesia and the third thing one economy which is for the hospital the second thing is the environment which we are doing for the world and also for us also because our environmental pollution is decreasing and so our exposure to volatile anesthetics is decreasing and the third thing which we are doing for our patient is because of rebreathing there occurs humidification of our gases and warming of gases see ideally it has been mentioned is that uh, the inspired gas should con- should contain around 30% should have a humidity of a relative humidity of around 30% and a temperature of around 20 to 30 32 degrees and it has been seen that with fresh gas flows of after around 15 20 minutes you are able to achieve these target uh, let me be the devil ad- devil's advocate on this and i would say that we are able also able to achieve this using hem- hme filters but still the one of the advantages of low flow anesthesia is that we are able to humidify our gases and we are able to warm those gases and that has been shown to have a benef- beneficial effect on the cil- on our respiratory ciliary epithelium 
So these basically are our advantages. When you are going to have advantages, obviously there will be some disadvantages also. So the first disadvantage is, and yes, this is a practical aspect, which I always consider this is that if I have a short duration surgery, let us say, um, let us say uh, you're doing a DNC, a gynecological DNC, 10 minutes, 15 minutes. 10 minutes, 15 minutes, you are unable to use low flow anesthesia for the very simple reason that the initiation phase, the initial phase of a low flow anesthesia is by itself is around 10 minutes. And in that time, Sometimes the surgeries are over. Maybe you are doing a simple incision and drainage of an abscess. So in those kinds of surgery, short duration surgery, low flow anesthesia is basically neither practical nor technically possible. So for short during surgeries, I don't find low flow anesthesia very practical. The other thing is capital investment. This is an important point in a lot of our countries, like let us say India or other third world countries, and especially in the, the, the smaller hospitals, the smaller setups, where they don't have that kind of economic muscle, that they are not able to invest, or they are, if rather I would say, don't want to invest also into, let us say, the capnographs, the gas analyzers, the workstations, the high-end workstations, the use of our desk urine, volatile anesthetics. So capital investment becomes an issue whether because of lack of the money or because of lack of desire uh, i would not go into that that is a matter to be discussed so capital investment is also an issue and the third thing is that obviously low flow anesthesia is more labor intensive you have to be more aware you have to be more alert you cannot have a hypoxic mixture being delivered to the patient you have to keep an eye on your rotameters you have to keep an eye on your gas analysis to see what is happening in real time so you don't want to deliver lesser amounts of volatile anesthetics or higher amounts of volatile anesthetics. And you have to keep playing with your dials because it is a closed loop. Things are happening on the patient end. So you have to match them at the anesthesia end. So you have to keep playing with the dials as compared to high gas flows where you just dial up the high, high gases and just you tend to forget what is happening. So it is more labor intensive. Uh, I have labeled this as controversies. Some people might call them disadvantages. I would rather say as controversies because I really can't call them disadvantages. It has been seen that some trace gases start to accumulate once we are using low flow anesthesia. Uh, this appears to be more of theoretically theoretical aspect rather than practical. I really don't know if it is practically so relevant. But anyway, since we are talking about it, what I will mention what literature has mentioned. Methane, one of the gases, we all produce methane in our bowels. And since it is soluble, it is found that it is expired out into, the, into our expired air. What is the clinical significance? Not very much, except that methane will interfere with our halothane gas analysis. And it can, two things can happen. You are not using halothane and it will start to show that halothane is being shown. I have seen that happening once or twice. I was not, I was a bit confused what was happening. Now I came to know when I read about this, that it is the methane, which is the culprit over here. Or if people are using methane, uh, I'm sorry, if you are using halothane, it will show higher if, um, uh, values of halothane than you are actually using. Acetone, especially if you have a diabetic ketoacetotic patient, they might expire out the acetone, which might be present into in the soda lime canister which you might the next patient might inhale it does it happen really or not i really don't know same with alcohol you have an alcoholic patient taken up for surgery his breath has alcohol in it that gets remains as a residual amount of alcohol vapors in the closed circuit and in the soda lime and the next patient starts to breathe it in and then there is carbon monoxide. I will deal with the carbon monoxide in a separate uh, topic because that is a little, a little bit more contentious. So trace gas accumulation has been shown to occur. What are the clinical significance of this? The house is still open on that. Is it really significant or not? So like I said, I will talk about carbon monoxide. Carbon monoxide, obviously we don't want our patients to be inhaling carbon monoxide because of its deleterious effects and how it affects our respiratory physiology. What has been seen is that carbon monoxide is found to occur more in desiccated absorbers. 
it was like it was been classically mentioned that more the carbon monoxide poisoning was seen to happen in patients who were who were doing their first surgeries on monday mornings when the uh, the soda lime had been allowed to dry it out to over the weekend so that is how it got found out that the early sunday uh, the monday morning surgery patients went into carbon monoxide poisoning and so it was found out that carbon monoxide is also a by product of closed flow uh, low flow anesthesia and it has been found to occur more in the desiccated dryer dryer absorbers more to occur with barrel lime which contains koh uh barrel lime i think so is used more in usa and i don't know if it is used where else india i have not really seen barrel lime happening so it is seen to occur more with barrel lime where you are using koh and used to see and it is been seen to occur more commonly with co and des so the important thing over here is a desiccated vaporizer and the important thing over here is use of co and des so if these things are not happening you don't have a desiccated vaporizer because barrel lime is more of an american uh, product rather than a trans world product so if you don't have co des and and the absorber is not dried out carbon monoxide poisoning should really not be a problem and compound air so this is the most consensus compound air when you are using co fluorine at low flow it is found that you have proteinuria glycosuria enzymeuria but again they are saying that even if i am having proteinuria and glycosuria it does not have any much clinical significance even when you are using it in patients who are having pre existing renal disease but fda it gave out a warning that okay if you are using co fluorine initially they said use it at 2 liters fresh gas flow and then they changed it to 1 liter per minute for 2 mac hours um india obviously does not have any such kind of uh, warnings i really don't know much about whether uk and the european areas have those kind of warning for co fluorine or not but yes fda has given this warning why basically because of compound air uh because of the problem of carbon monoxide and for compound air a new um, soda lime absorber by the name of amsorb was developed and uh, this to sort out this problem that it had carbon uh, coh and calcium hydroxide and calcium chloride it was hygroscopic did not con did not uh, have potassium hydroxide so amsorb was a new product which came up to tackle the problem of carbon monoxide and compound air two controversies before covid time uh, whether we can use low flow anesthesia with supraglottic airway devices uh i'll leave it open for the house personally speaking i have used it i have had fairly good results especially if uh, the supraglottic airway device has been fitted in properly without leaks i really don't know for other people but for me personally i have used it and i have had been able to do it with fairly good results and in our covid times the thing which keeps coming to us again and again is that once we are using the circuit and the soda lime in a patient who may or may not be covid positive can we use it again uh, the advisories which have come out is that you can use it provided you are using uh, at least a basic minimum of 2 hme filters or ideally speaking 3 hme filters with 1 hme filter being kept at the patient end the second hme filter being kept at the expiratory end and if you are going to use three hme filters then you keep the first one at near the endotracheal tube the second one at the expiratory port and the third one at the inspiratory port and with that it is being said that okay yes you can safely reuse your soda lime for the next patient if even if your first patient was covid positive so in the end i would like to say is that as our time changes as our the music changes so should our dance and so should our anesthesia techniques and i have seen the anesthesia techniques change quite a lot over the last 20 years i really would not recognize the anesthesia which i had given 20 years back and to what i am giving now thank you very much i am opening you all for questions thank you wonderful Okay, so uh, you can uh, switch off your uh, uh, screen now. Uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, and then we can all. Uh, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Hmm. 
So, Paul, your comments. Okay, yes, I, have a, I have a lot of comments. Yes, Paul, I'm <laughs> eagerly awaiting. Yes, we are, I, I wrote a lot of things. We are, but, we are tackling the same uh, subject from uh, slightly different directions. Yeah. Uh, you mentioned the word narcotics. I, ha I have the, the same form with the same phrase of uh, John Snow. Uh, I insist a little bit on the Greek translation of the word because people accept now narcotics synonym to opioids. Yeah. While narcotic <laughs> means sleeping. And yeah. I had a very, very hard time in different places when I use the word narcotic effect, yeah. people looking at it and said, what, what has to do morphine and opioids with that? It, it's very, it, it's okay. Uh, okay. Uh, oxygen consumption based on Brody formula. I also uh, found a lot of classifications based on fixed numbers. One liter, half a liter, 250. Uh, it is very easy to work with those numbers, but it's incorrect because you have one person that weighs 50 kilos, you have another one that weighs... Yes, I'm, I'm listening. Uh, just to interrupt. Yeah, yeah very clear. Uh, yeah, I would, uh, I would say numbers are basically just broad guidelines. Uh, yeah. I mean, I, I, I mentioned this maybe in, my, uh, in the middle of my talk. We should not go exactly by the theory. We cannot go exactly by the formula. We have to be flexible, like you said, the oxygen consumption for a for a 40 kg guy and for a 120 kg guy is obviously going to be variable. So we should be more flexible with our approach and especially with our gas analyzers available. Things become exactly. very easy in real time. Exactly. I'm just I'm just saying that while I show these numbers to my residents and other colleagues, I'm telling exactly what you're telling. This is only as an orientation for a so-called yes. standard yeah. patient yeah. of this. But yes. you have what we ha you have two identical patients of 80 kilos. One yeah. of them is full of muscles and bodybuilding and whatever. Another yeah. one is a little bit, you know, likes to eat a lot of McDonald's and things like that. The, the oxygen now and then they they start making the connection uh, okay a small uh, i hope you don't mind a small spelling uh, correction uh, it's not yes. serving house it's severing house ah uh, sorry 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 no, 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 <laughs> i will correct that I, this is how my, my brain works i pay attention to okay uh, Okay, you mentioned at the, the severing house formula on uh, uh, nitrous oxide absorption and the, the uptake absorption. Uh, you use that uh, mi minus a T at the square one, that the square root of time. Uh, yeah, maybe, awesome. may, maybe in India you use another definition for that. You said inverse. Uh, negative. I, I I used to call it the the negative of the square root of time, and I also explained that this minus I can put right like a fraction and put the square root of time at the denominator in the lower yes, part. that is basically what it means, right? You are very correct. Yeah, I know, I know. Uh, and I exactly as you did. I put the same formulas close to one another, and I showed the audience. Look at this minus uh, t and one on two, and this one and this formula. It explains the same thing, and the same thing I'm telling when I'm showing that graph. You took it from Dragger. Yes, uh, I did. With, with all, yeah, I know. Uh, with those gases with different colors, and I showed, look, you have different levels of the gases, but look at the, the curves. They follow the same, the same uh, trend, the same physical law. Okay. Uh, okay. Uh, in at different points, you mentioned the uh, nitrous oxide and what people need to do to raise oxygen, lower that. I work for 10 years without nitrous oxide. I don't have any problem. I don't have any problem with dilution. I don't have any problem with hypoxia unless I'm giving, I, it happened to me in the very beginnings, when I gave less oxygen than the patient really needed. So obviously the saturation went down. But now if I have the gas analyzer and I see the fraction of inspired, fraction of inspired, I saw that I see the difference. 
yeah. be, uh, being constant. And I'm looking at the uh, minute volume. I explain to the residents, look, this is oxygen consumption. I don't need to look at the patient. Okay. Another thing, many, many people use the expression MEC of 1.3, MEC of this is a misnomer. It's actually 1.3 or 1.2 multiplied by MEC. Because I, people uh, see, well, MEC of, yeah. MEC of Sivofluran is 2. Why do you have 1.3 and in the fraction of Inspired, yeah, I have 2 point something percent? Yeah, yeah, it is actually 2 into 1.3. Correct. Yes. The no, uh, should be uh, MAC uh, into 1.3. Yes. Um, at your at your slide factors influencing the build-up. You used a word that I, I'm not sure I met it. You wrote factor effecting with E like England. I think uh, you wanted probably rat affecting with A like uh, <laughs> like uh, yeah, okay. yeah. Having an effect. <laughs> Yeah. Okay. okay. Uh, again, using oxygen as carrier gas, no yeah. danger of hypoxia. Okay. Uh, I spent one year in Canada in 2008, and I was, uh, you know, explaining. One one year later, I came with a conference of low flow anesthesia and blah blah blah. And one of the anesthetists there, a uh, very nice lady, 1.6 meters with the hands up, uh, mm -hmm. wrote me that she tried to do the same thing, but she got with the patient hypoxic. Uh, I was in a very dire situation because I didn't know exactly how to react, but um, I thought if you are a trained anesthesiologist, mm -hmm. you are next to the patient, you are using only oxygen, and your patient becomes hypoxic, then I would like to, and then I would ask other questions. Yeah. What were you doing there? Mm -hmm. Anyway, uh, uh, time constant. I dedicate a little bit more slides explaining the time constant in general in the theory of the systems and then i go to the uh, uh, to the gases i explain the time constant is a mathematical formula like you said uh, explaining the uh, uh, the change uh, in a system from one level of equilibrium to the other level of equilibrium. It's a much more complicated formula. And it's also mathematical. And then I go down and explain uh, the gases. You have a patient that's at, at a certain level of anesthesia. Something happens and you want to deepen or to lighten him. You modify, you change something, either the flow, either the vaporizer dial, or both of them, so that the patient gets to another level of equilibrium. The time course of this process can be divided in four time constants. As you said, 60 something percent, 80, 90, whatever. Okay, and then the audience gets a little bit the idea that this is a process, not bricks in the wall, that they just remember numbers. Okay, uh, the volume of the system, as you said, I explained them that it's always the FRC with gas, gas changes plus the circuit, uh, the closed circuit volume, because they have to understand that everything, it's an interaction because yeah. it's between the anesthesia machine and what happens from the ventilator on. With the, the absorber, the hoses, the filters, it's a whole system. And then they get the idea that you cannot change something in the patient without changing something in the in the circuit okay um and the requirements i use in my presentation also another element requiring a minimum possible number of co connections because as more connections yeah. as you have you good can point. have you can have dead space and you can have disconnections yeah very good point. like it like it like an arterial line okay uh, you said that at a certain point, gas analyzer is very useful or very useful, but some people are, can go or um, when in my presentation, I say that the gas analyzer is a must. You don't have a gas analyzer, you don't do low flow anesthesia. Not because the patient will move or something, but awareness. You, if the patient is too deep, you see it on uh, blood pressure, heart rate, whatever. But if the patient takes beta blockants and doesn't react, you don't see it. Uh, and if the patient is uh, with the blood pressure going up or heart rate going up or starts moving or bleeding, 
his, his, the patient is already light and you don't know if the patient will have awareness or not. If you have a gas analyzer, statistically at least, you know where you are, or medical legally, you know where you are. Uh, You're uh, making not, notes, Paul. Of course. <laughs> uh, no, I, I, think, I, think this is a, I think this is a sign of respect for our colleague that works so hard. That's you, why you. I didn't want to actually have everyone uh, here. Uh, okay, uh, another, uh, another uh, BBC World Service English lesson. Uh, you said at one point that it's more labor in intensive, only that you write labor like labor in the delivery room. L A B O U R. Yeah, that's uh, it's in that is, that is American versus uh, the Queen's English. Is, yeah, I, I don't know. Yes, okay. yeah. Oh, oh, something of a personal experience with the methane. I was in Canada and I lowered the flow and lowered the flow and lowered the flow. And all of a sudden, it appears halotape. I called the anesthesia technician. It was a very young girl. I, I'm not sure from India or Pakistan. This was a child, a tall girl, black, eye, black hair, black, black eyes, beautiful girl. And I asked, listen, uh, did you have halotain recently here? Dr. Paul, what is halotain? And I said, okay, okay, <laughs> okay, okay, please call your boss. Her, her boss was an, an elderly, all, almost retiring, and he looked at the guest and the he said, Dr. Paul, we are in Canada. Mm. I think I saw the last bottle of Halotan 20 years ago. Mm. Said, so what come? I didn't know. I called my boss. He didn't know. I went home. I, of course, I checked and I found the solution like, like you said. Mm -hmm. uh, and then that gave me the opportunity to do two things. To explain our residents the difference between milliliters and dilutions in percentages, mm -hmm. and also the little de devil in me play with uh, this kind of thing. Uh, I was explaining to my residents that the, uh, uh, the methane, we are producing it at a constant rate because this is our body. But if we use low flow in methods of percentages, this, this methane takes a lot from the volume because the volume is recirculating. If we are using high flow, this, uh, this methane is washed out, exactly. So the next day I was trying to flow up, flow down, flow up, flow down. That of course appeared, disappeared, a bit hocus pocus like this. Like <laughs> Okay, Kept coming back to Israel, I was driving people crazy with my low flow and everything, and I started playing with the halota, with the sebo fluoride. And of course, the same thing happened again. And I looked, uh, I was sort of confused, sort of amazed, I felt like a little theater. And said, so, oh, I don't know how, to, and you, you, I, I, sh I could have recorded what people saw. It was amazing. I could have, I could have written a, a, a humor book. Instead of telling, but, but it's in many other parts of the world, it's as a human. Instead of saying, look, I don't know, I need to read about that. <laughs> Something explaining, all, they were all professors, it, it was very fun. Okay, uh, um, okay. about soda lime and the uh, Monday morning uh, hypoxia or hypercarbia. Uh, I I teach, yes, I teach my residents that once the color indicator uh, goes back, it vanishes, it's consumed, it doesn't go back when the CO2 goes up. The only thing you can, uh, you can, you can understand that your absorber, no matter which one is consumed, is to look at the fraction of rebreathed CO2. It is your if you don't change anything in your ventilating uh, parameters, then it will slowly, slowly, slowly go up. Yeah. Okay, sevoflurane and renal failure. I know the theory, I know there are a lot of controversies. Anyway, when I have a patient with the slightest degree of renal failure, uh, I prefer not to use it. Okay. IV anesthesia, isoflurane, it is still controversial. And no matter how the the I, I tune my anesthesia probably totally independent of my anesthesia the patient will um, 
will aggravate his renal failure. I don't want to have his disease on my conscience. So if I have two options, one that is possibly dangerous and the other one that is safe, I go to the safe one. Uh, you mentioned about supraglottic device. I'm using, exactly as you said, I'm using any supraglottic device I want as long as I have a good seal. Uh, many people have the, this misconception that all that protects the patient are two tiny vocal cords somewhere. And if we have a tube inside, oh, the patient is fantastic. I do laparoscopies on a daily basis with the, with the, uh, with the LMA. I'm doing this down with the LMA. Anything, as long as I have a good seal, I have absolutely no problem. Uh, something else I wrote. Oh, ah, I have another bit. Ooh, okay. Uh, you mentioned about <coughs> you mentioned about gas deficiency. Uh, I explain it a little bit because uh, this also can help you uh, explain the audience the difference between the flow that you are calculating and the leaks. I have some pictures with the uh, with the uh, bellows I did at the hospital going down, 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 showing it on mechanical ventilation and on breathing, uh, looking at the pressure and looking at the APL, uh, and looking at the balloon. Uh, okay, injection of volatile anesthesia. I saw it uh, as, a, as you said, is cumbersome. It is only good for teaching purposes. The prime, uh, like priming dose, cumulative dose, square root of time, that's a formula of Lee, giving the same dose at the, the square root of times, more and more, uh, okay. Overpressure, I'm explaining the, uh, my residents that is similar to IV priming dose. It's going up, giving a big dose, more than the, pa the patient needs, so that in time, even if you reduce the flow, the patient has a reserve from where to take gases. Okay, uh, at the recovery phase, uh, you reminded also the time constant for the washout. Either coasting, going very, very, very slowly, or uh, using high flows to, to wash out. Uh, I'm using what I like to call, maybe I'll write something on that, call it pseudo coasting. You're just in the middle of the surgery, if the machine is very tight and I have no leaks, I just turn the vaporizer out. And maybe in one of the films I, I put on the, on the, on the film, I don't know. Uh, so sometimes 10, 15, sometimes 20 minutes, I'm staying with the vaporizer out until I get to the Mac of, uh, Mac multiplied by 0, 8 or 0, 7. Below 0, 7 awareness or something, then I open it again. Okay, uh, at the Halotan, well, I know there are still countries that are using Halotan for, for very, very economical reason. I have been in Ethiopia two years ago. They are using in Indonesia in remote areas. They are still using in other parts of West Africa. They are using because, okay, uh, whenever I touch this subject, I remind that it's uh, dangerous for malignant hyperthermia and the hep hepatic toxicity. Uh, and uh, the advantage is heat and humidity. Uh, I have a few formulas, but I also have a few pictures when I show uh, when I show that on the expiratory limb and the uh, expiratory valve, there are practically vapors of water yeah. accumulating there. And the heat, I don't have pictures on that, but I, in, I, have, I had many cases when in long surgeries, because the patient was first of all covered and using very low flow, the heat and humidity, I didn't need to, to heat the patient. I had a thermometer somewhere in the nose or the oropharynx, whatever, and I didn't need to heat the patient. This is also an economical aspect. Uh, one more thing. Uh, this droplets uh, made me some uh, headache a few years, many years ago, when I was in the very beginning. I was using very low flow um, in a uh, in a cardiac suite, they, uh, a South Korean doctor was performing uh, uh, electroablation, or what it's called, from the endocard. Yeah, and all of a sudden, the, the room was uh, 19 or 20 degrees Celsius. It was very cold. The patient was warm, but okay. So you're working with low flow, low flow, low flow, and volume control, and um, all of a sudden, the machine stopped. Didn't know what happened. I was alone, quite in a quite remote place. I started manually ventilating the patient, 
and it was okay. And I didn't know what happened. Then I switched to pressure control and the machine started again. What happened, the, the flow meter that translated flow to volume was using a difference in diameters. And that small hole between the, those parts was clogged with water. Yes, and there was no flow. So no flow, no volume, the machine stopped. When I switched to pressure, then I gave another trigger. But you remember, you, you, you can imagine what was with my coronaries, with my heart rate, and the sense of relief after that. Uh, so basically, this, um, these are the things I uh, want to, to bring. And thank you once again. I understand you have, been, you have done a very long, look, after 10 years of eating this day and night, I can see from the first minutes who worked on that and who didn't. You did a lot of work, absolutely a lot of work and a very nice presentation. And thank you very much for that. And Shiv, thank you very much for allowing me to bring my input. Yes. And something very nice about, about what things I, I observe. Mm. Both Israel and India start with I, mm. and your name and our colleagues' name start with S. Yeah. <laughs> yeah. Yes, sir. Okay. Yeah, yeah. So uh, the... Uh, thing about other other thing i've been using low flows uh, uh, for much longer time i have used uh, low flows as, since almost 2003 or 4 and uh, my expertise is actually with uh, spontaneous ventilation and uh, low flows with spontaneous ventilation on uh, the supraglottic devices so i i use it uh, so but i do not actually go down to the uh, very low flows uh, tend to actually flee. This is actually actual low flows. So that's what I actually teach. So because in the airway, the supraglottic airways, you can actually have, you know, some amount of leak and, uh, but you can actually maintain low flows uh, with uh, supraglottic devices on spontaneous ventilation as well. Uh, mm. uh, yeah, I know you are a big um, proponent of uh, spontaneous ventilation. Somehow I have not been able to do spontaneous with uh, subglobrotics on, uh, on low flows. Yeah. Anyways, new challenge. Maybe I will try that out also. Yeah, yeah. So there, there what you think you're looking at is around, probably going to around five, 500 ml. So you, I think 250 ml is going to be a challenge. Yeah, yeah. Plus, I think it also depends. The reason why it is, is because our machines actually, I think, are uh, taking, uh, you know, for analysis, they do not mm -hmm. uh, put back the volume. Oh yeah, okay, okay. Yeah, so so in those machines, it's it's actually, I think, uh, we yes, need you to, have to be counter, careful. Yeah, you have to counter that to yeah, 200. Yeah, exactly, you need, to know, you need to know how your uh, analyzers work. I thought, yeah. Yeah. Okay, uh, now I have, a, after, after your comments, I have my four inputs. First of all, language. Uh, this expression, spontaneous breathing, it's a misnomer. Breathing is only spontaneous. Yeah. And yeah. ventilation is only mechanical. Yeah. Okay, about going going down. But a lot of people want this, I know. Uh, uh, go, going down with flow. People, a lot of people uh, ask me, how low do you go? Yeah. And I said, I, I go as low as low as, as low I can go. Mm. And on breathing with a closed circuit and with supraglottic device, basically I try to keep the, the well, peak expiratory pressure, the sort of peep in mechanical ventilation at five centimeters of water. I do, of course, I put the pop of bulb at 20 if anything happens so that the patient can. And I prevent atelectasis and I lower the flow as much as I can in order to provide enough oxygen to the patient, in order to allows you to going up and to compensate for the eventual leaks. And with my residents, I show them, listen, one, two, three, four, five, follow what happens with the oxygen and look at the numbers. And, and they get it. Uh, by the way of the, the gas analyzer, I always uh, return the gas from the exhaust of the gas analyzer back to the expiratory limb. So I don't need to compensate for that. We don't actually have that facility. I think yeah. it's not allowed. We are not allowed to actually tamper with our machines or do anything. So uh, what, yeah. 
Uh, well, show, tell me, show me some photo of the machine that you have with the gas analyzers. Yeah. I read some, sometimes I received a question in chat. Uh, someone asked me, well, but in mechanical ventilation, yeah. when you have a pressure of 20 or 30 centimeters of water, let's say peak inspiratory pressure, yeah. Yeah. it doesn't go backwards to the uh, gas analyzer. And I said, oh, I don't know. And I, I read somewhere that the pump in the gas analyzer usually stands pressures up to 50 centimeters of water. Mm -hmm. So even if you have a backflow, it doesn't bother the machine. Yeah, and uh, hmm? it, no, doesn't, it doesn't. It is actually a pump. It's basically a pump. So what it is doing, it, it is actually sucking out this 200, 150 to 200. Yes. And, and analyzing it constantly. That's a constant actually analysis and then it goes because we use scavenging it is scavenged out because it actually affects the way the things are calculated as well so i think anyway, uh, it, it, you you compensate you can measure the the how much the gas analyzer take and compensate for it but yeah. i don't think i don't think even even the united states i was taught about this how to return and the united the americans that are crazy with it medical legal and this don't make a fuss about that why should we i mean nobody bothers me Mm -hmm. No, it's not right. bothering. We are, we cannot actually tamper on because these machines are uh, serviced by the electrical, you know, medical electrical devices uh, departments. No, no, no. You don't. You don't get. A, you don't. You don't tamper with the machine. You don't go inside. You take the exhaust from the gas and I'll, I'll show. You, I, I made today some pictures. I'll show. Uh, you know what? From inside, I mean? it's all. We cannot actually access it in our machines. No, 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 you don't need it. Wait, 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 wait. Since we are here already. Uh, okay, wait. You can share your screen, it's fine. You can. Uh, no, 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 uh, it's yeah. on my iPhone. I don't know how to, you know. Look, I'll, I'll, uh, I'll send to, uh, to your iPhone, and if you can, uh, if you can, um, you know, upload that. I don't. I'm trying to see. It's it's on your phone already. Mm -hmm. uh, okay, I'm trying. The... Okay, you see here. I don't know. Yeah, we can actually see a little bit. Yeah. Okay, this is the exhaust of one of our gas analyzers. Mm -hmm. At the back. Okay. Is that and the here, back machine? Yes, and here is a regular extension line. Yes. That I'm connecting it here. Yeah. A little close up. Mm -hmm. Okay. Another model with the exhaust in the front of the machine. Mm. Another model. Okay. And here you see, I co I'm connecting it. Back you see, it's exp expiratory limb. You see? Yeah. Okay. Yeah. And I'm connecting it here, and that's it. Mm. Mm -hmm. yeah. You don't you don't interfere with the machine. You don't open yeah. it. You need another tubing. Hmm? Just you need another yes. extension tubing. It's an extension line, and whenever possible, I try to use uh, extension line from the arterial line, stiff, okay. so that I, I have a minimum a minimum dead space. It doesn't matter me, but I prevent kinking. Yes, yeah, and, and and it works perfectly. Yeah, yeah, yeah. Good, good, good idea. I will okay. see next time. I actually. Use it. I will at least try to do that. You no, know, <laughs> maybe it's, we it's, are able to then uh, go down on the flows because uh, you have to be 500 to 700. Maybe you can go down to probably 300 to 400 amount. When I anesthetize children of uh, 15, 30 kilos, hmm. uh, I go less than 100 mils per minute. I don't need that. Hmm. Uh, 30 kilos multiplied by three is 90. Mm -hmm. I have no leaks in the machines. Mm -hmm. Eventually, the, if the child is, uh, you know, moving a little bit or breathing a little bit, I, I turn the flow up a little, and th that's all. Mm -hmm. But I, what, I, I saw people that I'm working sometimes with 50 mils per minute, mm -hmm. and they said, "Look, I didn't have a heart attack up to now. Mm -hmm. I'm going out. I don't <laughs> want a heart attack right now." Yeah, yeah. Okay. Yeah. Uh, one more, one more thing. Actually, when you're using air, so. Uh, if you are actually using oxygen air mixtures, uh, one of the things you will notice that up, there is greater chances of hypoxia if you don't uh, you know, keep your eye on the uh, FI2 because the nitrogen accumulates in the system. Yes. Yeah. Like, like methane. Our, our yes. uh, soda lime has got zeolite, 
Zeolite is basically uh, the compound used in oxygen concentrators. So it, yes. traps, in, it traps in nitrogen. So initially it's okay, yes. but once it is actually completely, you know, as trapped or the molecules can't track anymore, the nitrogen starts building up in the system. And your FiO2 right. actually can go down despite actually having yes. the FiO2 of 0.7 at the machine, you will see the FiO2 have seen FiO2 go down to almost 18%. With long cases, yes, yes, that can happen. Yeah, okay. yeah. So in that, you can even cut off this this thing. You cut off the uh, air completely. Uh, that's the best solution to to that, obviously. Uh, but if that happens, then the only way to wash out the nitrogen is to actually increase the flows. You cannot otherwise do anything. It has to be vented out. So for yes, long with cases, light, yes, with zeolite, that is a problem. Yeah, yeah, yeah. So with the long with the long cases, you need to uh, flush out. Uh, if you are actually seeing that your FI2 is dropping uh, despite switching off the air. Yeah. Okay. Uh, for Dr. Paul, I would like to say he really dissected my presentation thoroughly. I mean, I, I am pretty sure he was li listening to every sentence I had. He to was say. making but, notes. Paul was yes, making notes. But I am highly appreciable of that. He has given us a good lot of good inputs and yep, which we will take forward yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah. Look, look, uh, 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 personal, I, I, I am so deep in this kind of things because in every hospital I work here and with almost every boss I had up to now, not only that they didn't understand anything, they just didn't want me to spread the word because they were afraid that someone else will with less, uh, you know, patient to read will do something, yeah. and then a tragedy will happen. And I said, "And how can we prevent this tragedy? Let's teach them." No, no, no. Mm -hmm. So I was, uh, you know, the more they hit on my head, the more I raised my head. <laughs> so, mm. so this is why I was taking notes and uh, and everything. Mm. 